ready with your PowerPoint and we can... Well, let's, do, well, let's just try it. Yeah, it's here. Let's just try it. I've got a really great picture of you and I, Noel. <laughs> <laughs> Very good one. What are you up to anyway? Oh, wait a second. I've got to get my... I'm By the way, we are now streaming live on Facebook uh, already, so perhaps we can uh, ad admit the audience in the uh, next... What time, what time are we starting now? I thought we were start, starting at 4.30. Look, we'll start early if you want to, I don't care. No, yeah, we, we start actually at, at 4... Uh, well, at right now at, uh, what is it, uh, 2 o'clock here? So yeah, 4 o'clock. Uh... Oh, okay. So summary, good job. I did get back in time then, because I thought it was 4.30. <laughs> I got 4.30. <laughs> so anyway, look, but that's yeah. okay. I, I didn't oh. know that you were using a code name, so we were looking for, of course, for the name Phil Piper. And oh, okay. Do I do? You, do am I? Do I? No, you admit them, don't you, Alfred? Who's who's got control of this? Uh, Ido. Oh, I should should introduce you to to Ido Balboa. He's the host and uh, will lead Hi, the webinar. Hello. Um, okay. I can admit them all right now. Okay. So okay. admitting. I'll turn my video off for the presentation as well. That's all right. Okay, Dr. Pavlik, I think we can start when you're ready. Okay, thank you, Aido. Okay, so hello and greetings everyone from the TRACES laboratory here at the RIT in Ateneo de Manila University. Welcome to our archaeology webinar series that presents current research and new discoveries in archaeology and paleoecology. As with our previous webinars, our audience today comes from throughout the Philippines, and we also have a number of colleagues who have joined us from abroad, and we like to extend our greetings to our participants from Indonesia, Malaysia, Hawaii, France, Germany, Italy, and the United Kingdom. It is our great pleasure to have as today's speaker, Dr. Philip Piper, Professor of Archaeology at the Australian National University in Canberra. Dr. Piper is one of the most distinguished and dynamic archaeologists you will find in the Indo-Pacific region. He is equally outstanding as an archaeologist in the field and in the lab. Dr. Piper has more than 30 years of experience working in Europe and Southeast Asia. His research focuses on identifying and interpreting complexities in human culture and economic behavior from the late Pleistocene to mid Holocene in mainland and island Southeast Asia. He collaborated with several legendary archeologists whose names everyone in the disciplines is familiar with like Graham Barker from Cambridge in the re-excavation of the great caves of Nia in Borneo, and Peter Bellwood, of course, in the projects in Luzon and Batanes. In recent years, Dr. Piper has concentrated on enhancing our understanding of the transition from hunting and gathering 
to animal management and the impacts this had on human society. Professor Piper's many contributions include several works on the paleobiogeography of Southeast Asia, the characterization of its vertebrate and invertebrate fauna, and their use and exploitation by early humans. Numerous excavations in the Philippines, in Borneo and Vietnam, and the discovery and identification of the famous third metatarsal bone of Homo lusonensis. Before Dr. Piper went to the Australian National University, he has been a professor at the University of the Philippines, where he established the Sioux Archaeology Laboratory in Upitiliman. Dr. Piper is also the Secretary General of the Indo-Pacific Prehistory Association, one of the largest associations in archaeology worldwide. Now, for this webinar, we have not one, but two great archaeologists and exceptional researchers whose work and contributions to the archaeology of the region and beyond I really admire. I'm very happy that Dr. Noel Amano, the head of the Sioux Archaeology Laboratory of the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Jena, Germany, has agreed to be the respondent for today's webinar. The host and manager of this webinar is again Mr. Aido Balboa from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, who will also lead through the Q&A section later. On behalf of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and ASIA, the Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of the Ateneo, I like to thank the people and institutions that made this webinar series possible. The members of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, the School of Social Sciences, the Office of the Vice President for University and Global Relations, Kalipunang Sociologia at Anthropologia, RT, the Creativity and Innovation Hub of the Ateneo de Manila University, and the Eduardo J. Aboitis Sandbox Zone. So without further ado, I now hand over to Dr. Philip Piper and his talk on Pick Out the Origin and Prehistoric Social and Cultural Significance of Domestic Pigs in the Philippines. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Piper. Oh, thanks very much, Alfred, for that um, introduction. That was very nice of you. Um, yes, I'm going to be talking today about pigs, um, something close to the heart of most Filipinos. Well, I should say stomach, really, rather than the heart. But anyway, um, we um, this research it focuses primarily on on the Philippines, but I'm going to move around a little bit and also talk a little bit about um, research that we've been doing in uh, Vietnam as well. Um, that has. Uh, Broader significance on the importance and significance, economic significance of pigs within the region. And it's really apt that uh, Noel has agreed to be the respondent here because a lot of this is actually the research we did together a few years ago. Um, so uh, it would uh, be nice to sort of reminisce a little bit as we move through this, through this sort of um, this uh, webinar as well. Right. So I will move to get my screen up and put on my presentation. I want to turn off my video, stop video. I'll stop my video, so less chance of it all going wrong. Right, okay, pig out. Origin and prehistoric social and cultural significance of domestic pigs. Right, okay. Right, today, this presentation focuses on early domestic pigs in Southeast Asia. And we're gonna, as I say, it's gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about the understanding of the origins and roots of translocation based on modern and ancient DNA studies and linking the genetic evidence for pig translocations with a zoo archeological record. This actually, we're looking at mainland island Southeast Asia broadly. Um, and then towards the end, I'm gonna focus more on research that we did in Nagsaburan in the Philippines and what the implications of that really nice piece of research by Noel and myself um, uh, have on our understanding, not just of the economic significance of pigs, but also the social and ideological 
significance of pigs in the past and in the present. Sort of builds the foundations of, of, of modern day ideologies and um, around, around pigs and, and pig domestication. So we've got some case studies. So first of all, I'm going to look at the dispersal of domestic pigs into Southeast, Southeast Asia, as would, will become very apparent in this, um, in this uh, presentation, that uh, domestic pigs are not native to the Philippine archipelago or mainland Southeast Asia. They're introduced, and I'll touch on that. And we'll look at the dispersal of pigs across Southeast Asia from where their potential origins are um, and the timing for that dispersal. Across, um, across Southeast Asia and out into the Pacific. Then we're going to look at Neolithic pigs and economies and new modes of settlement patterning in the mobile forages or sedentary farmers or something else. That research is focused on um, uh, excavations and uh, data from southern Vietnam. And then we'll move beyond economies and look at a little bit about a little of social archaeology and that focuses very much more on the Philippines and research we've done in the Philippines in the past. So in this initial domestication of pigs in East Asia. So domesticated pigs in Southeast and mainland and island Southeast Asia almost certainly have their origins in the region that is now China. So there are some reports suggesting domestication of pigs occurred in Zimpian Cave in Guangxi around 9,000 years ago and at Kuangyou site in Xinjiang about 8,000 years ago. These, are, these have not been substantiated with good Ziozu archaeological research and the question still remains open of whether these really are domesticated pigs, particularly in Guangzhou where um, this is south of the red and, uh, south of the um, yellow river and the Yangtze river where it's more likely that pigs were domesticated in the um, developing um, agricultural settlements that were um, rising up or developing in along the along within that region so in this image at the bottom here on the left hand side you can see this is the region we're talking about where pigs in, in China and Southeast Asia were likely domesticated. So clear evidence for domestication has been recorded at the Neolithic settlements in Nangzhou Nang Chou, and possibly dating to around 10,500 BP, and certainly by Jahu here in between the Red River and the Yellow River here by around 9,000 years ago. This seems to be the origins, the first and earliest known domestications of pigs within the region. So why have people been so interested in understanding the possible translocation of pigs from China into Southeast Asia and beyond? Well, part of the reason is, or a big chunk of the reason is, should we say, it, the logic is that pigs don't move themselves over considerable distances, and therefore they must have been moved by people. Right? So they're using pigs as a proxy for identifying the movements of people across the region from China, from China to, uh, central China, down through southern China, into mainland Southeast Asia, into island Southeast Asia. And we also know that pigs have been introduced to the Pacific Islands all the way out to all the way out through to, um, to Vanuatu and, and beyond. So when trying to study and understand um, the movement of pigs, there's two major problems arise. How do you identify a domestic pig from a wild pig? What makes them different? How can you tell the difference between them? Right. Um, how can we better understand where a domestic pig might have originated from? So there's two problems there. So there's one about trade, one actually tracing the, the pathways of movements of domesticated animals. And one is about actually identifying those domesticated animals from wild populations. So to answer these questions requires some pretty complex analytical methods. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about these analytical methods here, but we will certainly touch on some of them and how that how we've approached or how zoo archaeologists and geneticists have actually approached understanding um, or interpreting the roots of, of translocation pigs, movements of pigs, and also how we identify pigs in the archaeological record and then can link that back to these movements through their first appearances. 
So the first thing we're going to touch on is genetics. Genetics has been a, a growing topic for, for a long period of time now in archaeology. Um, and, and pigs have, were um, one of the sort of uh, early interests in geneticists, as I've said before, already mentioned, that they were interested in looking at the um, movement of pigs as proxy for understanding migrations of human populations. So how do they do this? Well, put simply, geneticists are look, at, look for particular genetic markers in modern and ancient pigs that can be identified and traced. So if you take, if you take the, the, the gene of a pig, for example, they're looking for what's called um, SNPs or singular nuclear uh, polymorphisms. Right? So these are little bits of, of DNA, which are specific to, for example, um, a domestic pig or, or um, a, a pig that is, has been moved that they can identify as it's been moved across, say, the region of mainland and island Southeast Asia. It's like a marker, a piece of code that they can identify. There's been two major ones in Southeast Asia. One is the Pacific clade, what's called the Pacific clade, because this is a clade of pigs that are actually moved out through into the Pacific, and hence it's being record, recorded as Pacific clade. Another is known as the Lanyu pigs. Now the Pacific clade seem to have their origin somewhere either in Southern China, Northern Vietnam, somewhere around that sort of region. Um, and they can be traced in modern and archeological pigs down through mainland Southeast Asia, down through island Southeast Asia, into New Guinea, out to the Bismarck archipelago and out through to Vanuatu down here on the right hand side. These are the Clades of, clade of pigs that were translocated through mainland island Southeast Asia and eventually made it out to Vanuatu in the Pacific Islands. The second is the Lan Yu pig. The Lan Yu pig, Lan Yu is named after a tiny island here off the coast of Taiwan, south coast of Taiwan here. Um, and basically these pigs have been identified in the Philippine archipelago. Interestingly, they don't seem to have been moved beyond the Philippine archipelago. Okay, so they just landed there. Actually, what's interesting, just as a little side here, what's interesting here is that pigs do not actually indicate the movement of um, those of you know the Austronesian story or the Austronesian migration story. Um, is that uh, the Austronesian migration is from the Philippines into Borneo? Um, and then and, and down through island Southeast Asia, Bismarck Archipelago, and out through into Vanuatu. And those Pacific Islanders are Polynesians even, are related to, uh, originated in Taiwan and the Philippines. Uh, pigs are not the way to look at that because they did not move from, they're not um, moved from the Philippines out into the Pacific Islands. However, chickens are, right? So chickens did get moved from the Philippines out into um, the Pacific. So they're another indicator. Um, a, genetic, a lot of genetics have been done on chickens as well. Um, and they were moved out there. So good indicators, but not always perfect for actually understanding human migration. So there's a cautious tale to be told there between under identifying the human movement through pigs and identifying the human movement through chickens. But for important for us at the moment is this movement of pigs and the introduction of domesticated pigs into mainland islands, Southeast Asia, and across the Philippine archipelago. So archeological evidence for the arrival of domestic pigs. Well, what do we have in terms of evidence for the first domesticated pigs or the earliest recorded domestic pigs, should we say? The archeological record does not always necessarily find the earliest, but we have got some quite early records for domesticated pigs. So these sites, these sites here, the black dots, actually uh, are locations or sites of where we've actually recovered um, domestic, early domesticated pigs. So if we take a look at some of these, we can see Mambak here has got domesticated pigs from around 3,700 Carl BP. Um, there's been no DNA, ADNA completed on the Manback pigs, so we don't know where they originate from. Ban Wat 
here in Thailand, we've got domesticated pigs from 3,700 BP, of Pacific clade identified. We have Anshun and Rak Nui, Pacific clade from around 4,000 cow BP onwards. Liang Bua, here down in Flores Island, here. In the in the lesser in the lesser Sunda chain, that's um, the Liambo is more famous for Homo floresiensis, but it's also got a later archaeological record there that also has a number of um, pig remains. They've been identified specifically at three thousand five hundred cal BP. Mananga Sapaco here and Kamasi, that's uh, early uh, settlement sites in um, western Sulawesi. Um, they've got dates are around 3,500 cal BP. We don't know where those pigs come from, but they are def certainly domesticated pigs introduced to Sulawesi. Watam D, we've got Pacific clade from around 3,200 cal BP. So you can see there with the Pacific clade, the earliest dates are on the mainland as it is, and the later dates are in the islands of Southeast Asia. But we've got some really interesting dates, early dates for the domesticated pigs within that region. What else do we have? Well, we have dates for Savadug, and these are Lanyu pigs, and they date to around 3,200 cal BP. And then uh, Savadug there is in the Batanis Islands, by the way. And then Nagsabaran, which I'm going to talk to a little bit and talk about a little bit more. Then we've got a direct date there on P4 at 4,499, 4,300. 32 cal BP, and I'll come back to that again in a minute, but those are land new pigs in, in Naxaparan. So there we can see we've got the land new pigs with dates, and we've got a certain number of um, introduced domestic pigs across mainland and island Southeast Asia that have the uh, Pacific Lake signature. So that gives us a clue to the movements of, of pigs across the region and their introductions and their timing of their introductions. So we're off to a good start. So now I'm gonna to move to looking at domestic pigs, settlements and the economy in Southern Vietnam. This is research that we started around 2012. Um, I think Peter Bellward and her team started at Anshun around 2007. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about, um, this is Ho Chi Minh City here. So we're down the bottom, Southern Vietnam here. This is the Mekong distributories here. Coming out here, I'm going to talk about a little bit about um, Anshan and Lok Giang. These are two settlement sites that are set on the Van Ko Dong River here. But primarily, I'm going to talk about a site called Rak Nui that um, Noel and I worked on back in 2012, which is at the confluence here between the Dong Nai River, the Van Ko Dong River, and the Van Ko Tai Rivers. Right down here, um, the very marshy is just in there. So the sites are generally located along substantial drainage systems, but they say, as you can see, Anshun, Anshun Lok Yang and Rak Nui, but they avoided the Mekong distributaries here. These rivers are probably too big, too much flooding, um, and they've set the settlements up on, the, on, the, on these more stable river banks. Excuse me. Close to estuaries, and settlements were established. Okay, so the earliest domestic pigs in southern Vietnam have been recorded from uh, Anshun and Lok Giang, and they date to around 4,000 BP. This is an image from um, the site of Lok Giang. Um, they're interesting sites, they're mounded sites, um, and they consist of a number of sequences of floor layers, um, all situated on top of each other. See my Vietnamese colleagues here. And if you can see the cursor here, you can see the edge of the surface of a structure that's in the, in the corner of the of the trench here. And you can see the archaeological deposits above it. There's layers and layers of this material. Um, these, um, these floors and, and structures were built one on top of another between about 4,000 and 3,000 B, 3,500 BP. So identification in this, in this instance was based initially on age profile profiling, um, predominantly sub-adult individuals represented on the site. So how do we do that? Why do we do that? Well, Basically, if you think to your lechon, lechon baboy for a minute, um, everybody likes nice young suckling pig. Now, like it now, it's the same sort of story in the past. 
what actually happened, pigs are really great for eating. They're not very, very much very good for anything else. So what you tend to see within when in communities or societies that maintain primarily pig populations, i.e. in southern Vietnam and other parts of Southeast Asia, they breed pigs. Pigs grow really fast at a young age. They reach a particular age and then they're not very good for anything apart from eating unless you're going to breed them. So what you see is you see a kill off pattern whereby people kill and butcher pigs at a particular age. And we can, as a zoo archaeologist, can actually identify that age from either the uh, bones, the fusion of the bones, that's when the bones grow and then the, uh, the ends of the bones actually fuse together. So we can work out the age from that. But more, more commonly, we use the teeth. So we, as, as in people, um, pigs have um, uh, milk teeth or their uh, first dentition and then that is replaced by the permanent dentition. And we can actually work out, we actually know how old a pig is approximately by where along that, along that pathway the pig was when it died. And quite commonly, this is around sort of 12 to 18 months old. So we can identify this, right? So we can, and you don't see that same kill off pattern or in, in wild populations, because in wild populations, pig generally live as long as, as long as they, are able to, right? There's not a, not a single kill off pattern like we see in uh, sometimes in domestic populations. So that's how we primarily did it. Then the genetics have added to that. So ADNA supports the domesticators by alloca with allocations of the Pacific clade, okay? But what role did pigs play in early societies in Southeast Asia? So the genetics and, and the identification of migrations and movements of pigs is one interesting factor um, that's useful. But I'm, a, I'm, an archae I'm an archaeologist. I'm interested in people and behavior. What, are we, what are we, can we learn about people's behavior? What does it tell us about what they're doing? Um, and, and what can we identify about their, you know, socially, um, ideologically about, their, about the people in the past? So I'm going to turn to I'm going to turn to the settlement of Rak Nui. Right? Now Rak Nui, there, there's our brilliant picture, Noel. <laughs> Down a very deep hole. Shh. Right, the, um, Rak Nui is in southern Vietnam, as I showed you earlier. Um, it's a large mound, um, circa almost 50, 50 meters in di diameter and about five meters deep. Um, the excav we excavated in, as I said in 2012, and the trenches were located in places where we wanted to optimize the um, what we could learn about the overall structure of the settlement, the layer of the settlement, um, and also we wanted to look for uh, Mark Oxenham was leading the project, like he was he was looking for burials and things as well. So there was former excavations here in 1978 on the on side this big trench here, and 2003 on the top of the mound here. Um, these had some interesting results, but what was very clear from looking at the archaeological records was that it was extremely complex, really difficult to understand, um, and we probably wouldn't learn anything new by sticking trenches down through the middle of the, uh, middle of the mound again. So what we decided to do was edge our bets and go towards the edge of the trench where it wasn't quite so deep that we could get down to the earliest layers so we could get some information on the establishment of the settlement and then have a look and more chance of seeing what was happening, happening at the end of these um, mounds. These mounds were likely to be something like developed settlements that built up and up and up. Um, if this was really the original edge, then maybe we would see the edge of these platforms that they were and, and house platforms and get some idea of what they're doing. Um, as it turned out, it worked quite well. So in trench one, so we're talking about trench one here. Um, Noel and I in this image here stood at trench one at this end of trench one up here. Um, so there was more than 13 phases of house platform built consecutively on top of each other on dating from about 3,500 to 3,200 Cal BB. So you can see this is a little bit later than Anshun and, um, and um, Raknui, um, Anshun and Lok Diang, the other sites. But it's more interesting in terms of, the, of what we understand in, in terms of um, uh, the pigs and, and the use of pigs. So it had a number of fence lines 
a number of surfaces. In the image here, you can see some of the fence lines, or these are, these are lightweight um, construction for the walls. Remland surfaces in the middle, and then they had surfaces on the outside of the structures. So this was actually the edge of a structure here. Right? And then we've got the construction, and then we've got surfaces outside. You can see the post holes going around the outside. Um, in the corner here, this test trench here, this is a trench here, huge posts in the profile here constructed. The surfaces were constructed from shell lime mortar, and this is the earliest records of the use of shell lime mortar for construction that we've got in Southeast Asia. So to look at in profile are the walls of the trench. So we're now looking at this wall of this trench here. You can see my cursor here. That's, this is wall, this wall here, effectively. This is a schematic drawing of that wall. You can see 13 phases, possibly 14 phases rem remaining. And you can see that they've built the structures or the floors one on top of another, right? And up, up, up it's actually gone. These are those large post holes that I was talking about. So you can see they've constructed time and time again on top of each other. And these surfaces have had hard, compacted, solid surfaces added to the end of the other structures. And the structures were then built on these exter softer external surfaces. What's actually happened over time is the weight of these surfaces here have actually compressed the underlying deposits, and this part of the trenches, this part, part of the, the structures have actually subsided. That's why they slope quite considerably downwards here in the profile. Okay, so that's amazing. So what what it means is they were building these structures, living in these structures, knocking them down, reconstructing on top, on top, on top, on top. Yeah, and that's why the mound has actually gone up as it has done. So I'll move to trench two. This is trench one here. On trench two here, the form is uh, in trench two. And this is one of the structures that we actually found in trench two. Clay floored structure and, and, um, that we uncovered. And that's one of these, schematic to one of that here. The surfaces, um, all the surfaces ended at this point here. These wonderful surfaces they built, um, mortared, mortared and, and um, pottery, manufactured pottery. And then they built this little trackway goes off from, from the surfaces, okay? So built a series of platforms, sequence of exterior surfaces, these rectangular structures. These rectangular structures were added later. They don't actually go down to the earliest phases of these, uh, of these um, uh, constructions, buildings. Um, the, the, the trench two aligned with trench one platforms. Um, this was clearly a permanent and planned settlement. That was the important factor here. This was clearly a sedentary settlement that people have invested in and they were staying there long term. So the whole idea was to set the scene to a certain extent here. We know that this is a permanent settlement. So these are the early permanent settlements that were being constructed in Southern Vietnam. These are no longer mobile foragers. These are people that are constructing settlements to live in long term permanent settlements. Yeah. A quick note, when I was in, when I went to another site, um, called Lok Ak, which is um, uh, on the Van Ko Dai River, the local inhabitants there had actually knocked down um, one of their old houses, which also had a, one of these um, soil floors, sediment floors, um, and was constructed in a very similar way to the structure here. You can see in trench one. What, the way it was constructed was these house structures were rectangular here. We've only got a portion of it. So if you can imagine, it would come over here, back up through here, and then extend off this way to the south. Um, the post holes, had, they had a row of three post holes, which were the main roof supports, right? And they were in alignment like this. The hard surface they put in and they actually constructed the frame of their cooking facilities on the top of it. So they had one of the wooden frames with clay on the top and then they built the fire on top of that. And they'd used concrete now, but the principle was the same, yeah? They put in a hard surface and maybe that's what these little post holes are for here, is actually, or, or um, these little holes here, are for the posts for putting the structure for the, for the, um, for the actual frame for the, for the fireplace or the, or the hearth on top there. That was an interesting enlightenment when I did that a couple of years later. Okay, back to the main, main issue here. So Raknui economy. What's important for us here is to, you can see we've got reptiles, birds, mammals, um, we can see we've got uh, river terrapins, bock turtles, Asian leaf turtles, monster lizards, snakes, saltwater crocodiles. 
Then we've got some ducks and geese and heron and various, various mammals, including flying foxes, macaques, silver langur. This is all the animal bone that we recorded from the archaeological excavations or all the terrestrial vertebrate remains, not the fish remains. There was thousands and thousands of fish bones. Um, this is a terrestrial fauna that we actually recorded. You can see it's actually relatively diverse. The numbers here, suffice to say, are the numbers of each of the different species or different taxa that we actually recorded. So we only found one bone of wildcat, for example, whereas we found 222 bones of domestic pig. We actually found 464 fragments of Asian leaf turtle, pond box turtle, and 58 fragments of river, river tur turtle, as you can river, river terrapin. As you can see, there's quite a lot of domestic pig here, right, present. There's also quite a bit of domestic dog present. So domestic pig, pretty much, do, or, or are very common within the mammals. They also very much like their reptiles as well. Reptiles are very common in the, in the diet people during, during the prehistoric time. Um, it's been underestimated in the past, but when you identify the bones, look at the bones, um, all, the, all the bone assemblages, you very often find a lot of reptiles, particularly um, turtles and monitor lizards. So you can see that domestic pig are quite common, but you can see there's an awful lot of other, other um, uh, vertebrates that they've been eating as well. And that's not to mention the huge amounts of fish that they were actually surviving on as well. So what does this actually tell us? Well, they've got domestic pigs and they've got domestic dogs. But the question is, were they really reliant on them? Well, from, from what we can see from Rak Nui, that's probably not necessarily the case. Um, so the community of, of fauna that, that we recovered is very indicative of lowland mangrove swamps. Yeah? We've got, you've got uh, the um, silvered langur here, which is, is common within the mangrove swampy areas. You've got the crocodiles, these river, the painted river terrapin, terrapins here as well. This is all mangrove swamp um, fauna. So they're hunting a lot of fauna, right? Um, but they're also maintaining domestic pig populations, right? So it seems that domestic pigs are integrated into an economy, economic system that's heavily, still heavily reliant on foraging as much as farming. So they've got very much a mixed economy. They've clearly not moved fully over to maintenance of domesticated animals. We see that much later in prehistory, sort of Bronze Age through to the Iron Age, there gets more intensification. Um, and then you start to see more dominance of domesticated animals. But during these early phases, you see, very often you see these mixed um, assemblages of some domesticates and then some, um, uh, a, a lot of hunted fauna as well on the sites. So this has provided us with some really useful insights into how domesticated animals are, are integrated economically into these early sort of agricultural settlements or these sedentary settlements that are, that are popping up across some mainland and island Southeast Asia during this period of time. So if I move beyond that and we start to have and come into the Philippines now, so we, we and we're also going to move a little bit beyond economy. So we're still going to focus a little bit on economy, but we're going to look, look at a little bit more of the social context at Nagsaburan in northern Philippines. Um, Nagsaburan was a site that I worked on in 2009 with Peter Bellwood um, and Noel did his master's thesis on this, uh, on Nagsaburan. It was such a really interesting faunal assemblage and one that provided some really interesting information. Um, I'm going to focus on just the pigs here, but actually um, Noel's thesis has also got some really exciting information on, on butchery, butchery practices, deer, all, kind, all kinds of stuff. Like, Great. So um, it's a large metal age shell midden uh, site in northern Luzon. So it's in Cagayan up here. So Nagsaburan Nags is up here in Lalo. No Filipino um, participants here will know this very well. Uh, Tagigaro City is here. Right? Um, the shell midden dates to around 2500 to 1600 BP. Um, the under, then you have these underlying silts dating from about 4000 to 3000 BP. So there's a sort of an early settlement underneath or early deposits underneath this later built up shell midden. So 
my interpretation of this is that Selman was actually deliberately constructed to raise ground level above, above the surrounding floodplain. I've seen this um, in Vietnam as well. You can see the light shell here deposits and then these dark horizons where people have been active on top of the shell midden here. Um, so they're building up the shell and then they're active on top of the shell midden. And we know they're active on top of the shell midden. Um, we've also got numerous human burials. Here's a human burial in the middle here in the shell. So it's in the shell midden, but it's been cut through into the earlier deposits underneath. And people dig burials, put bodies in, and the bodies can be dug quite deeply into deposits that already exist. So here is uh, Nagsabaran again, shallower shell midden here. These post holes here are all full of shell. So they're clearly excavated from the shell midden itself into the underlying deposits. Um, some of them are really huge. Um, and structural posts, and these were clearly supporting structures that were built on top of the shell bin or within the shell midden. Right? So they build structures again, they probably knocked them down, added shell, rebuilt them. Um, it's the interpretation of the shell mound. Um, within the shell mound and within the silts itself, we found a lot of well preserved, discarded pig mandibles and other animal, uh, other animal bones within the, within the archaeological record. They're in really quite good condition. So the completeness of these bones um, and lim limited disturbance following discard. Um, if people were walking around on this shell, I would have expected this lot to get really broken up and trampled, but they're not. They're, a lot of them, as you can see, both mandibles still complete. A bit, uh, they're getting a bit fragile. Um, it's a possibility that they, the structures that were actually being built on the, on the shell mount were actually stilted. Um, that would make sense. The animals and uh, materials and uh, been our animal bone have been deposited or discarded over the edge, um, and they're surviving in the in the in the build up of shell. Pig dominates at Nagzibaram, but you can see we've got some other taxa represented. Um, we can see you've got some sharks and rays and dolphin fish, uh, soft shell turtles, but you can see pig dominates quite substantially. But we've also got quite a lot of deer and a few bits of dog. This is a total NS NISP. This is from the shell mount itself. Um, so we've got two pills, I put two pigs in the pot. So the fill of, so how do we differentiate between the domestic pigs and the wild pigs? All right. So the Philippines has got a number, I think it's five, if I remember it rightly. Um, species of endemic pigs found across the Philippines. So in Luzon, you've got this Philippinensis. Um, in, in Palawan, you've got this Ohonobarbus. Um, and then you've got various other, other Sebifrons in the Visayas region. So you've got various species of, of endemic pig that have all evolved on the various islands. Um, and I think the Philippines have got more pig species than any other, any other uh, place on the planet, I would think. Um, and then on top of that, you've got Suscrofa, which has been introduced. So how do we differentiate um, Suscrofa, the domestic pig, from a species of endemic wild pig? It's important that we do that to, I uh, want to identify when it actually occurred, and two, to differentiate maybe what we can see in terms of with the utilization of domestic pigs versus the utilization of endemic wild pigs. So how do we different, differentiate? Well, the Philippine, so it's Philippinensis is actually a really dinky little pig. Um, and we used dental biometrics to tell the difference. So the pig on the, the tooth on, this is the same tooth. Um, it's, a, it's what's called the third molar or your um, wisdom teeth at the back of your jaw. In humans, this is the third molar. Um, this is a domestic pig here, so an introduced domestic pig, and this is the dinky tooth that you get from a Sus philippinensis. As you can see, morphologically they're different, and importantly, size-wise they're also different. So what you can then do is you can use, uh, this is a bite, by, you can measure the teeth, so you can measure the width of the teeth, and you can measure the length of the teeth, right? and you can then make yourself out some nice bivariate um, illustrate bivariate graphs like this. And the dots, as you can see here, 
Arsa scrofa. These are introduced domestic pigs. These are modern comparative ones. So we've used modern comparative measurements of Suscrofa, Sus philippinensis, the endemic wild pig are these squares. They're modern comparative ones. We use these so we know the actual size of the modern comparative. So we got, um, we got something to work to. So when we then add in the archeological specimens, we can then add them to the modern comparative data that we've got. So you can see in the modern comparative data, these are different teeth. So this is the um, M1, a molar. This is the second molar going back, third molar going back. And this is the deciduous fourth premolar. This is a, one of your milk teeth, the last one that's actually lost. It's a very distinctive tooth in the jaw. You can see basically that in the modern comparatives that you get the domestic pig as expected is much bigger than the wild pig, okay? So we've got something to work to. When we then add the archaeological data to that, you can see it separates out as well into domestic pigs and wild pigs. Hooray! So we can actually see, separate out and differentiate domestic from wild pigs. Uh, so that's how we did it. So the size differential, species differentiating permitted two important lines of research to be pursued. We were able to then isolate one of the domestic PT, the fourth premolar, and we were able to then get a direct date on that tooth. So the, the domestic pig fourth premolar is introduced and we got a date of 4,499 to 4,332 Cal BP. So we know that it must, that domestic pig was introduced by that time, right? So we've got a date for, the, for introduction of domestic pigs. We're also able to determine, as you can see in both these diagrams, these are the wild pigs here, these are domestic pigs here, wild domestic, okay? There was wild pigs considerably outnumbered domestic pigs in the assemblage by a ratio of more than four to one, right? So this indicates that there are more wild pigs in the archaeological assemblage than there are dom domestic pigs. And that means they're likely to have made a greater contribution to the diet than domestic pigs. Would that necessarily be what we expected? Well, kind of yes and no. Huh? So pigs we know are important in the Philippines beyond just being economic. They have other very important social and religious status. Huh? So even up in the Ifugao, which is up in northern, northern Luzon, the Ifugao still maintain their black pigs. Yeah, and they keep those specifically for particular um, social and religious festivals, right? There's ethnographic parallels, as I say, from the Ifugao in northern Luzon. They keep their native black pigs specific for ceremony and ritual purposes, and they differentiated from more general eating pigs. In the past, those eating pigs were more, most likely the wild endemic pigs. Now they usually keep the sort of European introduced pigs, you know, the, the big pig pink pigs that breed fast, economically important, but they still maintain their black pigs for festivals and ceremonies. So is this what we're seeing in the, in the prehistoric period? Um, it could possibly be the case that we're seeing the same sort of um, retention of black pig or the, or the domestic pigs for particular ceremony and ritual purposes. And this is why we don't see quite so many of the bones or teeth in the archeological record because they're not being slaughtered on quite the same rates as we see the, um, the uh, eating pigs or the wild pigs. So what does this do? What have we learned? Well, you can see a combination of archeological and genetics research is proving a robust mechanism for identifying global origins and routes of translocation of pigs and other domesticated animals. And we saw how the genetics are being useful for identifying the routes and translocation of, of pigs across Southeast Asia. Um, and it, to a certain extent, they can be used as proxies for human movements across the region. However, as we saw there, as, as we also saw, there's a note of caution there. The movements of particular domestic animals doesn't necessarily exactly follow the patterns of human migration um, themselves. So we need to be cautious in interpreting um, human mobility from 
domestic of from the introduction of domesticated animals being moved out of their natural territories or across regions where they don't didn't formally exist. It's possible to identify the nature of human settlement and economic strategies employed that are associated with the earliest domestic pigs in Southeast Asia. Places where early human management practices into context. So what were they doing? Were they actually, when, when, when these settlements were, were established and developed, were they predominantly maintaining domestic managed pig populations and that made up the predominance of their diet or were they also uh, considerable amount of more foraging and collection um, in these early settlements and the latter seems to be the case. Um, we seem to find on these on these settlements that they've got domestic animals but domestic animals don't necessarily make up the majority of the of their of their diet right? and reasons that we've looked at here um, uh, to do with human pig interactions and this may exist in other other taxa as well in the past um, what are what are we actually doing what are they what are people actually doing you know? what are they doing in the social and and ceremonial ritual context what significance do, to domesticate animals have in the past right? and this is important in understanding human behavior not only in the past but in modern periods as well right so a lot of our traditions these days as you can see, I've, I've, got, I've, I've got a long history that extends way back, you know, even to the earliest agricultural Austronesian populations that actually arrived in the Philippines. And they can be traced all the way back, which is a really exciting outcome from this research. So I will end it there. Um, I'll put this up. These are some of the main references that I used in this, um, for this uh, presentation, if anybody's interested in them. And I will say thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Phil. That was a wonderful talk about uh, a topic that definitely interests quite a number of people, me included. <laughs> so I had to get some lech on in there. That was important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm already feeling a bit hungry. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, well, now is the time to introduce our respondent, Dr. Noel Amano. And, and Dr. Amano is the head of the Zoo Archaeology Laboratory of the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Jena, in Germany. And, and this is quite a dynamic institution and a world leader in the research on human origins and evolution. And that's where Dr. Amano is involved as a head and a partner in a number of highly successful projects. So he's conducting research on subsistence strategies in the rainforest and in coastal environments of South and Southeast Asia. And he's collaborating within multidisciplinary projects in Indonesia and in Sri Lanka, Timor-Leste, and of course the Philippines, where he also partnered with last week's speaker, Dr. Inchiko, in the research on the Kalinga rhinoceros. And of course, as we have just seen now, uh, has worked with Dr. Piper in several research projects. Very recently, Dr. Amano reported uh, on, on something that's it's really fascinating, on the oldest bow and arrow technology in Eurasia and an amazing archeological discovery that identified the earliest long distance projectile technology in the tropical rainforests of Sri Lanka. And that was more than 45,000 years ago and much, much earlier than we previously expected. So Dr. Noel Amano, thank you very much for being with us today and for agreeing to be our respondent. Thank you very much, Alfred. Uh, thanks, Phil. Uh, it's a pleasure. Phil is the person who gave me my first job in archaeology, so uh, working on the site <laughs> in establishing the Zoar Club in in in, uh, in the Philippines in UP Diliman. So it's really a pleasure to be here and to see Phil present our research from some time ago. So uh, the interesting thing that uh, Phil mentioned is the role of the domestic pigs in early agricultural societies in Southeast Asia, specifically in the Philippines. And based on other sites that we look at, it seems to be the trend up to the recent historic 
uh, time. Like even in, in Kalinga and Ifugao, you have sites from the late middle period, early historic period of around 1400s, and you still see the same kind of proportion of wild versus domestic pig, which says a lot. Like uh, they were, they have terracing and plant, they are planting rice and they, are, they have root crops and all of, uh, and settlement patterns are widely observed. Not that dissimilar from what you would observe now in some parts or all those are recorded in ethnohistoric records. But the, in terms of like pig population, they have the same that what we observe in Nexaveran. So that's quite interesting, I think. Am I responding to this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah, no, it's right. yeah, look, look, it's fascinating. It's really good that we've got that. We've got that zooarchaeological data from that sort of in-between period to a certain extent to demonstrate that that continues. Um, I, I suspect that continued as, as long as there were lots of wild pigs still to hunt. Um, as pig populations dwindled, I suspect there were there were. Um, it, it, it may well have changed for a certain period before we got introduction of other other um, domesticates from elsewhere. Um, as I say now, I think all, all my my experience was that they've um, that they they, they use um, other types of other types of domesticates like introduced sort of European pigs and things like that for for for, nor, for other eating practices. We see we see it in Borneo as well, same sort of thing. You know, as a as a bearded wild bearded pig populations have, have diminished. They've, again, they've turned to the European pigs. They do the same sort of thing there too. They, they maintain their, their, their um, traditional native black pig populations for, for ceremonies. So yeah, it's a, it's a regional, regional practice. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the um, I think in terms of the emphasis placed on domestic animals, specifically pigs in terms of subsistence, I'm not very well aware of the zooarchaeological record of South China or in the places where you have uh, the centers of pig domestication. Uh, would you know if, like, in terms of like contribution to the diet, if it's mostly domestic pig that we have, or it's like because I'm thinking that the pattern, the mo uh, the model of like huge animal husbandry, like farming, that is sort of like the the incipient, like what we think of when we think of agriculture, might not be really applicable when you when you look at the sites in Southeast Asia until the historic times. Um, look, um, southern China is a bit, a bit difficult. Um, it's a bit difficult to get at the literature for, go for Guangxi and Guangdong region. Um, oh, excuse me. Hold on. So that's that's a bit tricky. So the um, former student of mine, um, uh, Rebecca, she the one that I know that's been done best is the stuff that's been done in the northern Philippines at Manbac. And there again, we see we there we see mostly domesticated pigs but we do but it's it's much more difficult the genetics are not being done um, and whether the, how hard it would be to distinguish wild from domestic um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I mean to, you may be will be able to answer this better than I do I do I can Noel because you, you know your genetics a little bit better well certainly a lot better than I do um, once you once you get once you aim for a source population of domesticated animals, so the, the Pacific clade, for example, right? How would you how would you distinguish that marker from a wild population at the point of origin? Yeah, that you can't because you're just basically <laughs> looking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what I thought you were going to say, right? So, <laughs> so actually finding the points of origin of these of these actual domesticated animals are really difficult. You can see where they moved, and when we get direct dates on 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 the, the remains, then you can actually tell when they've been, what, what time they arrived at those particular points. But actually find the point of origin is difficult. Um, Gregor and the geneticists will say there's probably somewhere in Southern China, um, uh, Northern Vietnam, somewhere, some of that, what is that now that region? Okay, of the Pacific clay, but that's not the earliest domestic peak. Um, of course, because they're further up to in the Yellow River, Yangtze, Yangtze region. So there's all kinds of, as you know, there's all kinds of other genetic stories there with introgression and all kinds of stuff that would make it all really quite tricky to, 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 to determine, right? So that's one part. The other part about man back, um, the, the, um, Rebecca did this really interesting research because she actually looked at another site in the region there called Kong Kong Lua, which is a, um, 
is a foraging settlement, which is a couple of thousand years earlier. So Man Back is around 4,000. Um, Konkong Noor, I think if I remember right, it's about 7,000. Um, that site there is dominated by buffalo, uh, which is quite intriguing. And a lot of those sites, well, some of those sites in Southern China and that region of Northern Vietnam are, are actually dominated by buffalo, which is, it, which is a fascinating story in itself. But as you know, across Southeast Asia as well, in, the, in those sites that have been, uh, um, where the zoo archaeology has been done very well, they generally dominated by, in mainland Southeast Asia, dominated by deer, right? They are dominated by deer. Um, and then once you get to these so-called agricultural settlements, Neolithic for want of a better term, you start to, you start to see, all of a sudden you see pigs dominate in the archaeological record. So it's kind of interesting that you see this, this transition from, from hunting of deer to management of pigs and, and uh, with, along with these sedentary settlements. So that's something else we see. And she demonstrated that quite neatly in, in her research. Yeah, that's very well, very, very good point. And also like uh, we are lucky in the Philippines because it's quite, as you've shown, quite straightforward in differentiating well be between, uh, between wild and domestic pigs. Which is also uh, another interesting point to bring up, it, like in terms of modern day uh, issues, is like the issue of conservation because you have wild pigs introduced and be becoming feral and taking the ecological niche of the of the wild pig. So you have like conservation issues, uh, introgression and inbreeding between uh, interbreeding between these two different species. So yeah, it's another thing that is like one of those unintended products of uh, of introducing domestic animals or uh, escaping domestic animals to the to the wild Philippines. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah, the Philippines is one of the, one of those places where it was it's fairly it was actually interesting, fairly straightforward to differentiate between um, wild and domestic. Oh, but, uh, no, I should say in the Philippines that uh, um, Palawan's a little bit more tricky yeah. <laughs> because the Hoanobarbus is uh, is a larger pig species and therefore it's uh, it's it's a little bit more difficult to differentiate between between the between the um, uh, wild and domestic there. Um, but it should be it should be possible in Versailles. I don't know if anybody's actually tried it in the Versailles region. That should be possible. Um, do you know? I don't know if you remember that uh, Thomas and I and you and Alfred also co-authored a paper where we did a biometric. Uh, oh, did we? All right. <laughs> <laughs> we did it like in 2014. I think it's in IJO. So what we did in this paper is we compiled all the, ah, yeah. the modern data and to see which pig teeth can be used to differentiate which species kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Uh, we're yeah, more yeah, 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 I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we yeah. sort of like said that uh, domestic pigs are easily with Sus philippensis, it's like what we showed, and Sebi fronts and Olivera, it's quite, uh, but the bigger pigs are a mess. Like you, you, you cannot just by metric data say anything. And even uh, uh, the Visayan warty pig, there's an overlap in measurements uh, between uh, between them, so between domestic yeah, and yeah. wild. So we got very lucky in next Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Take up all the of all the species in the in the that's Philippines. A, that's the kind of research project that's always very nice to deal with. So yeah, so that yeah. So we you, you can you can see some interesting you can talking about um social economic. Well, one of the things I didn't actually talk about, I'm going to move slightly away from pigs here for a second, because we're I'm, I'm, and another kind of important important. Uh, species um, in the past, uh, we didn't talk very much about technological significance. Right? So what we see, as we saw at Naxabaran, um, there's a lot of deer. We also see in the Philippines, I'm not in, in, in Vietnam and some of the sites in Vietnam. So even in some of the Bronze Age sites I've been working on in Vietnam, there's a considerable amount of deer um, in some of the sites. Logak, which is just down the road from, from um, Antwerp and Lok Diang and Rak Nui. Um, there's, a, there's a considerable amount of deer um, on those sites. Uh, yes, they're economically they're great to eat, but one of the, what they're also after is they're after the antlers and they're after the uh, long bones in the legs for making, excuse me, for making bone tools. So they're making bone artifacts. Um, Loch Garak and a site just up the road called Goat Ochua, they've got thousands of bone artifacts loads of offcuts and they're specifically using the antlers and, and the, and the long, long bones, the metapodials. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they're actually hunting quite a lot of deer as well as the fact that they're probably quite fairly abundant and 
and a, a good food resource as well. So these things, these kind of things, we need to keep um, keep in mind when we're thinking about you know the strategies people are actually employing to for hunting for hunting particular types of animals can be can be a little bit more complex than, than first meets the eye. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, also, like it's a question of. And uh, not only, uh, as you said, subsistence economy, it's like retention, differential retention of parts uh, in, in archaeological sites. Uh, we are lucky because we are looking at uh, habitation sites, like uh, especially in Exaveran, where it's basically undisturbed and we know they are mid and deposits, which might, might not be the case all the time in other sites where you have differential preservation per layers or in, in different sites, in different areas of the same site kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm um, just to, just to say on this, to, to, but so the, this whole idea of working on sort of more more social archaeology, looking at uses of of animals, um, we've been working on that for a while now, and and of course it extends back further than the, further than that as well, even back to the late Pleistocene and your work with Tom on on the sort of um, uh, and Goabraholo and Song Tarus and specific hunting of was it the lutong isn't it the javan yeah. lutong yeah as a, which is a type of type of leaf monkey um and you know they, they seem to have been had a specific a particular relationship with that with that species of monkey which again is really interesting to move just beyond subsistence and start to think about other types of human behavior in the past and if we start to think and more people start to think along those lines we'll make really interesting progress in terms of understanding you know behavior behind beyond the you know the normal sort of the thoughts of diet and things like that we, i think we have some questions uh well it's it's amazing listening to to both of you it's like traveling back in time to to the old days <laughs> that uh <laughs> listening your, to your conversations but yeah, yeah i think we yeah. have a, a few questions and uh Maybe I just turn over to uh, our co-host, uh, Aido Balboa, um, who will lead through the Q&A section. Do we have time, Aido, for a couple of questions? Yeah. Uh, you're muted, Aido. Uh, maybe two questions, but um, it's, I think it's more fascinating to hear Dr. Amano and Dr. Piper you know, <laughs> converse. So I, I wish, you know, they didn't stop, but um, that's um. I'll read um some questions. Um, the first question is from Rimbo Gunawan. He asks, "The last pig picture looks like a bearded pig." Um, Sus Barbatus. I found in Kali Kalimantan. Does the Sus Filipinensis relate to the Kalimantan Sus Barbatus? He asks. Uh, the answer is yes. It is Sus Barbatus well spotted? Um, and uh, no, <laughs> it's, the, it's the answer there. Yeah, they're, well, they're, they're, they're like all this, like there's they're, they're suits, they're in the Zeus, genus Zeus, so they're related, uh, distantly related. But the but can... Philippinensis is um, endemic to uh, the uh, Philippine archipelago, uh, it's not found anywhere else. I would always say this, like, you, if you look at the, the morphology of the pig, you would have the bearded pig, like the Barbatus and the Honobarbus and the Java and Warty pig as well. So in, in Java, we, they have like the beards and then you have the Filipino pig, which are smaller and have the punk hairstyle, So they have the Mohawk. So you have the Sus Filipenses, you have Sus Oliverae and Sus uh, Sebifrons, and they are much smaller and they are the island, island pigs. So yeah, it's quite how you differentiate them. Mm. And there's Sulawesi, it's got its own species as well. So Celebensis. Okay, and we have this question from um, the registration from BB Monkey. Um, it's about connections among Austronesian cultures and society uh, or Islamization of Southern Philippines. He or he asks, how did indigenous peoples transition from pork eater to Muslim? Sorry, what's this? Um, Bibi, oh, Monkey, uh, Bibi Monkey asks, how did um, indigenous peoples transition from pork eater to Muslim? 
Uh, well, that's a that's a that's a religious ideological question, and not probably one that I not not I'm not sort of qualified to answer. That's um, that's a gen transitional sort of uh, yeah. I I, I I I don't feel that I'm I'm qualified really to answer that question. I mean, that's a that's a that's a conversion to 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 Islamic uh, tradition. Okay. Um. No worries. Um. I think I can read another question from uh, Mr. Gunawan. Um, he asked, the, the Sus Scrofa was also found in Gua, Guapawan of Bandung, West Java, that dated back to 3000 to 9000 BC. Guapawan or Pawan Cave in a karst complex in Bandung. Your presentation mentioned that Sus Scrofa is domestic pig, but I wonder how can this species come to the cave dwelling people of Kwa Pawan? Was the scrofa at that time wild since it's almost impossible to domesticate it? Uh, to, to, uh, sorry, I'm, clearly I didn't make myself to, uh, clear here. The scrofa is actually a wild pig, right? It's a wild species of pig, which is found right across Eurasia. Um, and actually down into Malaysia, and it's found in Vietnam. I, don't think it comes down into. Does it come as far as um, Sumatra, Noel? Do you remember? No, uh, the, uh, it's, it's, no halfway down, it's halfway down, halfway down Malaysia, isn't it? Um, yeah. And so it's 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 wild and it's been domesticated. That's that's a species that's actually been domesticated. Right? That's the important factor here. So this is why it's, for example, it's difficult to identify early domestication in mainland Southeast Asia because you know, you've got wild Suscrofa and you've got domesticated Suscrofa. Um, Gua Pawan, uh, how did they, do you, and Rimbo, do you know how they differentiated Suscrofa from any other species of pig at 9,000 BP? Um, no. You can come back to me. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know that, I don't know that research and I haven't seen that, I haven't seen the uh, zoo archaeological evidence for that, so, so I don't know, because there's, there's several species of, of um, Sus in, in, in Indonesian archipelago. So, um, so I, I don't know how they differentiated that or distinguished it. And based on my work in Java, it's quite difficult. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't able even to uh, differentiate even in the late history, early historic period because it's really morphologically very, very similar in terms of size. You have the Javan warty pig, Sus verrucosus. Yeah. And in terms of morphology of the dental remains or, or the teeth, it's it's quite straightforward. So I think more research has to be done. I didn't focus much on the pigs in my research, but because there's not that much of them in the sites I looked at. But yeah, I think more research will be needed to really ascertain the the, the presence of Suscrofa in Java as early as 9,000. Okay, and um, a final question from um, Mr. Mahapagal from UP Diliman. He asks, what is or are the earliest archaeological evidence of ritual use of pigs in the Philippines or Southeast Asia? Well, we can, as I said, we can make the inferences from, from Nagsabaran, right? Um, and we don't have absolute, you know, the, the, the smoking guns, so to speak, you know, of, of uh, body parts, pig body parts being buried with people, for example. But, We've made inferences from what we understood in terms of the, of the proportions of domestic and wild pigs um, and linking that to what we see in the ethnographic record from uh, areas like the Ifagal, for example. So it could potentially date back to at least 4,000 years ago. And who knows, hunter-gatherers before that may well have also had their own ritual uses for pigs as well. We just don't find it in the archaeological record. Um, in Borneo, um, uh, my colleague and I, Ryan Rebet and I, made and made a put forward an argument from the zoo archaeological record. There, we found um, uh, disproportionate numbers of mandibles and maxillae, or the you know the underjaw and the and the skull in the um, in the late Pleistocene or terminal Pleistocene, about fourteen thousand years ago. And we argued that they might actually be using using this, um, the, the skulls or mandibles, I can't remember which way around it was now, for actually, they, they were taking them and put, put, putting, them, putting them as markers on trees or things like that. 
So they may well have had, so they do, they, um, some of the, the Punan, for example, in Borneo still do this. They put mandibles, they hang mandibles on trees as, as, as identifiers and markers. Um, we argued that they might well be doing this 14,000 years ago. We don't know for sure, but there's, there's kind of little sort of snippets of evidence there that we can, that are, that are starting to suggest that this is actually the case. Um, we need more research. We need more zoo archaeologists to be thinking on this way and thinking beyond simply subsistence and start thinking about what else they're, they're seeing in the archaeological record. And when they do, we'll make an awful lot more progress. Right? I'm sure a lot, there are lots of the evidence is there. It's just actually thinking, you know, having, having that, those thoughts within your mind about what you want to achieve from your your archaeological your zoo archaeological analysis um and 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 sort of picking out these these different types of um different types of evidence from the from the archaeological assemblages so ryan rabet my my colleague who i was working with on the near cave stuff in borneo he he noticed he was looking at the butchery of the primates very very closely and he noticed the cut marks from leaf monkeys and and macaques were in different locations um, it put forward an argument that maybe people actually knew, people clearly knew the difference between um, macaques and leaf monkeys, and they were actually treating them differently in terms of their, their, their patterns of butchery. So this is kind of, kind of like what we call an ethnotaxonomy, you know, where, whereby, or even an archaeo ethnotaxonomy, taxonomy, if you like, where we're identifying, you can identify that people are, are, are differentiating between different species as well which gives you a clue to also to their behavior. If they can differentiate between them when they're, when they're butchering them, it clearly means that they know them as different species and therefore they'll know their different behaviors and, 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 and habitats and ecologies. And that will then impact on what they're doing in terms of their hunting strategy and their, and their, and their relationships with those different species. As Noel did with a Luton, Javan Luton, for example. I mean, that's fascinating. Why, why are they specifically hunting Javan Luton? That's makes no make ecologic uh, so hunting wise that makes absolutely no sense you know there must have been you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming no there was as many long-tailed macaques as there were Javan yeah. lutons in the environment and they just weren't doing that i mean why uh, actually i uh, think you might find this in but uh, our findings were quite a question by nichman recently in uh, current anthropology and he was like yeah it doesn't make sense uh, and he says like if you look at the and so he has he puts forward this sort of environment argument that the environment might be the cause but we always say no they have um, freshwater shells from the mangrove area and you actually have macaques like it's present but in very very small amount so we believe that people had access to these kind of environments and they really just have some sort of attachment with the leaf monkey for some reason and uh, another thing that i find very interesting and again I, I i would agree with feel like we can move beyond subsistence is like the use of ornaments for example like phil's research in java uh, in, in borneo and ryan it's very interesting where you have phil uh, if, correct me if i'm wrong like uh bangles made out of tusk and they are being repaired because uh, like you have the holes and you can see the them repairing this task and this sort of give you an idea of the importance of the material culture and we know as people we ass we assign importance not only with the material culture but with the sort possibly the source of uh the material culture of, of, of the animal human relationship again we cannot substantiate it but we can infer on it because we have we also observe this in modern ethnohistoric record all right, thank you, Dr. Pipe. Thank you, Dr. Amani. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Aido. Uh, thanks, Phil. Thanks, Noel. Uh, wonderful talk, wonderful conversation. One last question from, from me. Uh, what are your plans to return to the field? I mean, Rahnu is, is so impressive. So it's, it's like is this multi-level settlement uh, rising like, like an Arabian or Mesopotamian tell is it's really an amazing site where you can work for, for many more years to come. But now, of course, since we are in the middle of this pandemic and who knows how long this will take, um, do you have any plans to return? Uh, yeah, I got, I got, um, I've got funding to go back to go back to Vietnam tomorrow. Unfortunately, the Australian <laughs> government won't let me out. But anyway, so we, 
So yeah, we've got we've we've uh, identified a whole lo whole load of other sites. Um, some slightly earlier, some sort of around. But so we're still focusing on that sort of transitional period around sort of uh, starting around five thousand years ago up until about three and a half thousand years ago. We've we've located um, we started work on some sites in an area called Ninan. Um, these are shellmitten sites. These are almost certainly um, deliberately constructed shellmins. They're building on, they're, they're laying down the shell. These are big flat oyster shells. Um, Placuna placenta, um, the same ones, window, known in the Philippines as window pane oysters because they're used for, they, they're used for put, the, the Spanish put them in the, put them in the windows. Right? They're the same species. They're laying these down in thick layers, um, constructing dwellings on top of them, fireplaces we found on top of them, you get thin layers of deposit. Um, so we started looking at those and we started looking at some sites that are slightly later to so one side and the other side of this transitional period. Um, and we, we've got a whole load of sites to go back to work on, excavate and investigate, like our Queen Van, we've got permission to excavate Queen Van. We've got a, another one which is, um, when I went to see it in the end of 2019, we were working on another site called Dendoy just down the road from it. Um, and we'd heard about this shell mound that was still existing. Um, and we went to have a look at it and my God, it's over 10 meters as well. It's about between eight and nine meters high. Uh, it's, in, it's the most incredible thing. It's just made out of these oyster shells. They put those burials in them as well. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna have a look at that and then we're gonna have a look at some other settlement, other settlement sites. So we can get more of a handle on, on this sort of um, transitional period. So what, so interestingly, like a lot of these sort of sedentary settlements, I mean, I've talked very much about the sedentary settlements that have got um, a lot of domesticated animals on them or managed animal population or got, also got some evidence of, many of them got evidence of rice agriculture like Manbak, Rak Nui, Anshun, Lok Diang. Um, but we then went and excavated a site called Taklak, which has got similar, similar sort of material culture in the upper layers. I mean, by pottery and ornaments and various things like that. So it's typical of that period. Uh, site around sort of 4,000 years old and it's just full of deer. <laughs> so so it's, uh, these are interesting and these are these coastal settlement sites. Um, so there's the, the, it looks very much like there's, there may well be different economic, uh, economic strategies um, at different, different areas. So maybe in, maybe in the fertile um, uh, river terraces, a river like the Red River, which is known as the Fung Nung culture, there are agriculturalists along the coastline. They're more sort of uh, focused on, on, um, on, on foraging re and, and, and fishing resources. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of fish bars. Right. So um, yeah. So there, there could be. And then what we're what we're seeing is we're starting to see, starting to pick out sort of trade between them. So they're, they've they've got um, there's there's clearly clearly linkages going on. So in southern Vietnam, one of the things that we we also record. I talked about Rak Nui there. Um, uh, the, and I mentioned the Dong Nai River. Um, up the Dong, up the Dong Nai River, there's another load of settlements called things like Kam um, Rua and and um, um, Milop. And these sites are just downriver from a load of quarries. And these quarries are actually mass producing um, stone artifacts. So they're mass producing chisels and adzes. And basically, they're carving them out. They're actually polishing the blades. The blades finished. And then they're just shipping them out and trading them down river. Right? It's incredible. Right? Sounds like our own them. Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> so they, and this is this is like 3,600, 3,700 years ago. So there's all that. So a lot of these that we're also we're already seeing this sort of differentiation in terms of trade and trade networks developing and people specializing in particular sort of trade goods, so to speak. Amazing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope and fingers crossed uh, that uh, you can soon return and uh, I, I definitely would, would like to see those sites. And They're incredible. There's a, there's, a whole, there's a whole landscape of them. In, like, I, and I, was, I was astounded when I went down there. I saw, that, saw all these sites. It was quite incredible. Great. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll work there and then further up and um, up at, up at um, I've forgotten the name, name of it now. Where's the, where's, the, where's the famous resort? How long? So we're going to have a look, go up to Harlong and have a look up there. That's a nice place to work. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, I think we, we used our time very well. So 
Thank you very much, Dr. Piper, Dr. Amano, for this wonderful day. And thanks to our participants uh, and the questions. Before we end uh, this webinar, let me give, uh, give a quick announcement for next week. Our speaker in next week's webinar will be Dr. Rintaro Ono from the National Museum of Ethnology in Osaka. And he will present a talk entitled Human Migration and Island Adaptation in Maritime Asia, Cases of Island Southeast Asia and the Ryukyu Islands. Same time in one week from now, Tuesday the 25th. Okay, thank you very much. Take care, stay safe and see you next week. Thanks very much, Alfred. Thanks participants thank for, for joining us. That was great. And thanks, Noel. I'll be in contact. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.